feel that you are so blessed yes. this morning do you bring everything that he has given you and blessed you with to him to just worship him today yes, is that what we want to do here in this place today just say amen amen, amen. amen. and that's what we want to do is just bless, uh, worship our lord and savior today and with that said we want to welcome you to aceville baptist church this morning what a joy it is to be here and i hope you're here with the same heart a joyful heart and a loving heart I want to also just say, if this is your first time visiting, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it, and if you're visiting with us, it's always an honor to have visitors here in our midst, and you're always welcome. And I uh, just want to just say uh, a special thanks to all those that, uh, if you were here last week for Revival, I hope you enjoyed Chip yes, uh, Sunday morning and Sunday night, and what a great day. And I, I pray that God's fire of Revival, the message and the charge that we heard last week, will continue to go even this morning. With that, I want to just say there's a few things that we need to mention in our, about some announcements real quick. Remember, tonight, before we start our service, we'll have a, a business meeting, a special call business meeting that has been called by our trustees and our deacons. They'll be sharing some information with us at 6 o'clock, so be here for that. And then remember, on the 26th, our Thanksgiving soup and cornbread supper. And then on next Sunday morning, we'll be taking up our special offering for Connie Maxwell. And what we do is we take that money along with what we have in our budget. And then on December the 3rd, we will uh, take that down to uh, Connie Maxwell. And every dollar given is double that day called Giving Tuesday. So it's a great time. They have an opportunity to raise some extra dollars. So be praying about that. I know we've already had some given prior. So we'll take that money and we'll write one check and deliver it down there on that Tuesday. I think that's uh, one other thing, uh, uh, just remember, uh, we've got some that had mentioned and we're going to start planning and just talk about it a little bit. So right after the service this morning, any men, boys, if you're interested in helping with a wild game supper, meet down front, Justin will be down here and some others, and you all talk about it and it's just kind of a preliminary to get some uh, excitement going and that will be over after the first of the year, but if you're interested in helping him with that for our men and boys wild game supper, meet down front with him right after the church service. Uh, that's all the announcements I got. You can see that we've got some things coming up, the annual Christmas supper and many others that will be happening. So just remember those in the days ahead. Is there anything else as far as that goes? We do want to just look at these beautiful boxes and uh, we will also, during our prayer time, and I do want to just mention a few before we we go to the, uh, we're going to pray over these boxes, but I just want to mention a few people on our prayer list. Continue to remember Miss Diana, uh, older, her brother Donald passed away. She's in New York with them right now. Be praying. She'll be driving back on tomorrow, so be praying for her. Pray for Riley's not been feeling good. Kevin Reese has not been feeling good. The, if you could just remember those, I know a lot of them. Mr. Larry, good to see you after two or three year, weeks of not being good, so... So good to see you sitting back in your place there, buddy. Thank you so much. Continue to remember uh, many others that have been mentioned. Uh, we had a, a, a page full on uh, Sunday, uh, a Wednesday night, and it's good to see Rebecca here. She rang the bell on Thursday, right? Amen. Continue to pray for her. Amen. Isn't that great? It's always just a joy to see her walking down the hall, and it's just so good to see what God's doing in her life. Continue to pray for her. She's got some appointments coming up and some things that will be going on. Just pray that God will continue to heal that body. And uh, Dwight, good to see you here. I know you're back there in your place. Uh, you're behind me. You scare me sitting back there sometime, okay? I like to have you in front of me. <laughs> no, I love Dwight, but it's good to have him. And Mr. Shipman, good to see you. I know you had a treatment this week, so we've been praying for you. Thank you for being here. And, and guys, there's so many others. Are there any others that we need to just mention before we go a little bit further in our prayer time? Well, if not, at this time, Randall, will you come up? I just want to not only pray for our sick and all of those, but look at these beautiful boxes. What's the number? 133. 133. 
You know, we got 133 boxes going all over the world. We don't know where they're going, but God does. Amen. We know that God's going to be putting not only a smile on some little faces that we may never see here on this earth, but one day in heaven, I think God's going to reveal those little ones that have the seeds planted in their heart, and they come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ through these boxes and I think we will know I know for a fact that you will see that person one day and they'll say thank you thank you for all of these Randall I'm going to ask if you would would you just pray over these boxes and I want everybody just to maybe just be bow your head pray over these boxes and and remember our sick lit and sick too but just just right now pray and just ask God's blessings upon these boxes as they'll be going to where he's got them headed right now here this morning, you can still bring them tonight. We'll be taking them this week, but you can still bring them tonight if you say, oh, I've got some more. You fill it up and you bring it on back tonight, okay? Okay, let's stand as we sing our offertory hymn, Give Thanks.
week, that course, a roof above you. On December the 1st, we're going to have uh, Greg Lentz and his family with us, who is with Hearts with Hands, who right now is still working with the people. You know, sometimes for us, we forget about what they're going through. We rode through there, and there's a lot of people in that area that don't have a roof over their head. They're sitting in a tent. So this day, we sung that, but I think we need to just give God praise and thank him for what we do have. Amen? And be continue praying for those people there as they're being ministered to through by those uh, hearts with hands and that those volunteers there. Let's sing that chorus one more there time. There you go.
Well, based on the time of fellowship, you got yourself a lively crowd to preach to this morning, brother. Yeah, they ain't finished yet. Man. Have we got any Church of God in here? It looks like we're going to be running this morning. Everybody's running around. Well, I'm not Riley. I'm three times her age and ain't near as pretty, but I guess, uh, I guess I'll do in a pinch, right? Uh, we appreciate y'all being with us this morning. I'm going to share a little song. It's really, it's really one that um, describes me. If you don't know me, I think the song fits me. I clean up pretty good on Sunday mornings And I look like someone who belongs in church but I know both me and him know I'm not perfect Yeah, this old boy could use a lot of work But ain't it good God loves people like me Just a common everyday run of the mill Ordinary so falling short of what he ought to be A little Grease on my jeans, dirt on my boots, a truckload of doubts, and a boatload of blues. And when I look into the mirror, I'm just glad he sees more than I can see. Ain't it good? God loves people. God loves people like me. Sometimes I'm a little rough around the edges I've said some things I wish I could take back And I've been known to tiptoe out on the ledges I've done things I wished I hadn't passed a fact But ain't it good God loves people like me just a common everyday run of the mill Ordinary soul Falling short of what he ought to be A little grease on my jeans Dirt on my boots A truckload of doubts And a boatload of blues And I just look into the mirror I'm just glad I see I can see Ain't it good God loves people God loves people like me Sometimes I think I'm wearing out His mercy And I'm leaning on His grace to extreme But ain't it good God loves people like me Just a common everyday run of the mill Ordinary so falling short of what he ought to be A little grease on my jeans And dirt on my boots A truckload of doubts and a Load, load of blues and I just wish I had the faith sometimes of some of the other folks I see ain't it good God loves people God loves people like me ain't it good God loves people yeah, ain't it good that God loves people? Well, it's so good that God loves people. God loves people like me.
feeling God's presence through song, we need to just say, have the benediction go home. What do you think? That was good. Uh, <laughs> but since Dwight's here, I'm going to have to preach a little while. <laughs> but, hey, you know what? A, a second message of uh, what I started back in October the 20th. I, I got to looking at the date I preached uh, the uh, first uh, message on this little series, and it's going to be kind of hit and miss because of the holidays, but it all goes together talking about I doubt it, you know, things in the Bible, and, you know, we can't have faith without doubt. Remember me saying that a couple of months, weeks ago? Well, today I'm going to be talking about taking God at his word. Do you take God at his word? You know, in Jeremiah, we'll see in a few verses, uh, we'll look at it in a minute, moment, but the evangelistic organization known as Crew, they asked college students all over the country what were the top questions they would ask about God. And the first question was this, how do you know there is a God? And then the second question they asked was, how can there be a good God when there is so much evil and suffering in this world? And the third question was, is how can the belief in God be reconciled with science, especially evolution? Now, I want to stop right there with those three because I, I, I truly believe, and, and with all due respect, I believe, I, I, I truly believe not any one of those. I do not believe any one of those three questions are the single most important question to ask God. Okay? Let me tell you what I believe is the most important question, and I want to tell you why I believe it. And I think you may agree it is the most important question. If there is a God, and has that God spoken to us? That's what's important. If there is a God, and has that God spoken to us? You know, almost 3,000 years ago, there was a king in the Bible named Zedekiah. And he was facing a tremendous, tremendous crisis. The nation of Judah was about to be taken captive by the Babylonians, and things looked very, very dire or serious. They looked like the end for them, and he really didn't know what to do. He knew the prophet Jeremiah, and he called him to the palace, and he asked him this question. Jeremiah 37, 17, part of that verse says this right here. He asked Jeremiah, is there any word from the Lord? You know, that should be our question today and every day. Lord, is there any word from you for us today? You see, that's really the question. Because it's totally irrelevant to us if there is a God, if that God is not spoken. Doesn't mean anything. If that God has not revealed himself to you and I, because the most important question about God are, what is his name? What is he like? Does he know us? Does he care about us? And does he have a plan for our lives? And can we have a relationship with him? That's what's important, those questions. Now, there is no way we can ever know any of those answers to those questions unless God has spoken. Okay? Bottom line. Not because the preacher said it. Not because the deacon said it. Not because the church said it. Unless God says it, we don't know the answers to those questions. Well, Christians believe that he has spoken. Can I get an amen? amen. Everybody in here should say amen. amen. If not, come up front after the end of the service and we'll make sure you're a Christian. But it's every Christian should believe that God has spoken. We should believe that he has spoken in a book. And that book is called the Bible. Amen. That's where he's spoken. Now, here's an interesting fact about all this. The word Bible was never used in the Bible. Think about this. The Bible never calls itself the Bible. The Bible's favorite title for itself is the Word of God. Now, before I talk about the Bible is the Word of God, you have to concede that there is just no other book like this book. Amen? No other book. The Bible is not only the best-selling book of all time, but it is the best-selling book every year, year in and year out. Matter of fact, they say over 5 billion copies have been sold. 
Take any other best-selling book in any given year and the Bible will at least double or maybe even triple the number of sales of that book. In 2023, I looked it up, Ends With Us is the book, the number one bestseller in New York or whatever they said. It sold 1.29 million copies. In 2020, I'm told that uh, the sales increased. Now think about this, 2020 COVID, sales of the Bible increased 55%. That's unbelievable. And our good friends, the Gideons, they placed over 700,000 Bibles in hotels last year. Amen? But you got to think about it. The average American household has at least four Bibles. And if you don't believe it, go home. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure every one of us here today can probably get close to that dozen or more that you have accumulated over the time. If you go in my office, I got about three or four dozen of different and of mine that just different things, okay? But the average household, they say, has four Bibles. And they say the most conservative, and this is a very conservative estimate, says that 25 million copies of the Bible are bought in the United States every year. Wow. It's the best selling book by far. But on the other hand, throughout history, it has also been considered to many people, like Joseph Stalin, and what's that old guy in North Korea, Kim Jong Un? Isn't that how you say that? Did I say that right? I'm sorry. And many, you know, many people, and even library attenders, they say it's the world's scariest book. Now you think about that. They say it's the most dangerous book. You see, the Bible was one of the Americans. They, I, I got this thing. The Bible was one of the American Libraries Association top ten challenge book of 2015. All right. So why is the Bible so scary in, to, to people? Why is the Bible banned in so many countries? Why is owning a Bible something that can get you killed in many countries today? And why is it so scary and so dangerous? Why? Have you ever thought about that? For us, it, it doesn't make any sense. But in a lot of countries, it does. A lot of places, these boxes will be going. They have to be careful. They can't be any Bibles. In them. They can be some uh, gospel tracts, but no Bibles. You see, the reason all of that and, and owning a Bible and the scary part is because there, there are, and in my opinion, well, let me just say how I want to say this. This book is a very divine, life-changing book. Amen? It changes lives. The words in that book have an impact on people's lives. It makes people different people. A recent History Channel documentary entitled 101 Objects That Changed the World said the single thing that changed the world more than anything else was the Bible. Now I'm telling you everything that you already know, but it's a reminder sometime because I'm going to challenge you. It has, this Bible, this book has been blasted, it's been banned, it's been burned, and burnt, buried, and, and, and it is still the most single published book in history. Think about that. It's translated in over, I think, 1,200 plus languages. And just think about what that takes. That takes an army of translators. All right? So when you start seeing, and there's a lot of the Victory Bible Press and a lot of these that take donations to get Bibles translated, there's still people group with no translations, okay? So it's important to look for those. But when you look at how people view the Bible, you find various opinions, even in this church. That some of them are negative. There are those who say the Bible is not the Word of God. They deny it. Then there's some who say the Bible contains the Word of God, some parts. But I'm going to tell you what, they sometimes distort the Word of God. But then there are people, and I'm going to just tell you, like myself, and I hope you're like this, I hope you fall into this category, who say the Bible is the authentic Word of God. It's the Word of God. You see, and I hope people like that, they declare the Word of God. For whatever reason, the majority of the world, and even many people in many churches, doubt the Bible is true, truly the Word of God. And you say, what do you mean by that? Because we don't live by it. You have instructions, unless you're like me. I don't read all the instructions, but, but you're supposed to have instructions. We should live by the Word of God. 
You see, even people who believe the Bible is called a good book don't necessarily believe it is God's book. Now, I'm, I have to use this word, and I, I'm just going to say, I'm dogmatic. I think that's the word I want to use. I am dogmatic when I say, in my opinion, if this is not God's book, it's not even a good book. You say, whoa, I'm serious. If that's not God's book, and if I can't say that and I don't believe it, I don't even think it's a good book. What good would it do? It is God's book. It is God's word. So we're in a series that I'm calling, I doubt it, and I'm saying outright that on the one hand, there is nothing wrong with the doubt. And I said that a couple of weeks ago. Because I said you can have faith, but I, I said you can't have faith without doubt. You can't have faith without doubt. If you don't ever doubt something, you don't go research it. See, but on the other hand, I think we ought to doubt our doubts sometimes. You say, well, Preacher D, you really going on one of them rabbit trails there. But I really do. I think sometimes we ought to doubt our doubts. We ought to present the case for faith against the case for doubt. And let the best man win, I guess you could say. You know, sometimes we just take the word of somebody instead of really researching it. We got in a deep series... <laughs> conversation yesterday in our men's meeting this preacher was sweating but it was fun because we got to researching and checking it out and even went home we're gonna look ourselves but you see we are in a as I said that if we don't have doubt it's hard for us to have faith my whole point is very simple the word of God is as good as God's word you know in our world today we say a man is only good, as good as his, his word? Let me tell you what. The word of God is only as good as God's word, and it's perfect. It's good. It's awesome. You see, Jesus himself even believed you could not, uh, uh, that you could not only take this book as God's word, but God is as good as his word because in John 17, 17, you know what he said? 17, 17, chapter John, your word is I love that. Now, that's a simple Bible verse to remember. There's some others in there, but just your word is truth. If the Bible is God's word, there are certain reasons why we should believe it is when we examine it and when we read it and when we study it. And I want to give you five quick things this morning why it's important and what we need to do. The first thing and the reason uh, uh, why we should believe uh, the Bible is God's word is number one, I believe the Bible because it is historically reliable. Any history buffs in here? The, no, no history. Good Lord, y'all going to be bored about this point. The Bible is histor historically reliable. You know, and I hate to say this, but sometimes I think that's why government officials in a lot of countries don't want you to remember your history. Because I remember my history of some whippings I got when I was growing up, and it made me change, right? But you see, whatever else the book is, is a history book. This Bible is a history book. In fact, it's so historically uh, specific, the geographical details in it and, and how they go through the Gospels, for example, is not in the same, it's just unbelievable. It's not some mythical thing. It is real, and it's in a place it happens, and you can go walk it. I've walked those places myself. Many of you have been there and walked it yourself. You see, those are what's important. Bethlehem is real. Nazareth is real. Jerusalem is real. All that is real. And you see, we see that, and when Jesus started walking in his ministry, and you start studying that, the geographics of it, when he goes to a wedding feast, he goes to one at Canaan. He travels everywhere, from the Sea of, the, to, of Galilee to the Jordan River to the Mount of Olives and to the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes, and you can go there now. It's not some make-believe place. And you see, you can still name places that exist today, and you can get the geography right, but still not get your history right sometime if you're not careful. You know, that's true. I want you to understand that nobody can definitely prove or disprove what was take, has taken place in the ancient past or present, but the evidence. I want you to keep uh, these things in mind when you determine whether or not something historically happened 
in the time there, when you go there, and when you look at that, sometimes you have to make sure that's happened. The trustworthiness of something that is in the historical account is something that you need to make sure of. And it's based on the evidence that, that you read about in the story, in the account, and there's so many, so much in the Bible that you can. You see, the evidence must come from ancient documents. And, and I tell you what, one of the things that I really remember when I was in Israel, we were in a place that they had just uh, discovered in the last few years and were actually uncovering coins, uncovering things in the ground that were ancient, that was sign, going to make uh, pretty much the history part of some things come alive in the days ahead. What a joy. And you see, you can tell that about the Bible. And you see, as we read history books, we need to understand that a lot of things happen. When you read the history books and talk about Custer, and I bet you I can get some of our kids today to talk about the last stand, Custer, how he took the last stand. They had know it didn't take place at Cracker Barrel over on exit 19 in Anderson, right? They know the history. They know where it took place. You see, that's what this Bible is all about. That's what it's all about. You see, everything in the Bible is true. Everything in the Bible is real. Because you can't find any evidence that says something different. Let me just kind of give you one quick example. The entire civilization, such as the Hittites, were an unknown outside of the Bible. Do you know that? Outside of the Bible, they're, they're unknown. Because you couldn't find any evidence of a group of people called the Hittites Existing, people said, and the Bible was histor historically unreliable is what they were saying. That's what they were saying. Nowhere else was it. And the Bible was all untrue because of that. So listen to what happened. Then the capital city of the Hittite Empire was discovered as well as 40 other cities that made up the empire. It was discovered. Think about that. That makes it real. Now think about this. Another example is King David. He is mentioned more than a thousand times in the Bible, and yet for many years outside the Bible, nobody could find a record of anybody named David. Have you ever thought about it? We've heard it a lot. But the world hadn't heard it. Again, they said the Bible can't be relied on historically. That's what people say. That's what they do. They'll find something and they'll run with it. And then God says, okay, let me just show you all about it. So in 1993 and 94, at the northern Israeli site of Tel Dan, a 3,000-year-old uh, stone was found with the inscription, the king of the house of David. Hey, see, you can take the whole book of Acts. I'm just telling you how true this book is. You can take the book of Acts. Luke claimed to be a historian. Doing history, uh, he did some re historian research. And one of the greatest archaeologists in history, Sir William Mitchell Ramsey, an atheist at this point, because he was trying to make the Bible out alive, but anyway, who got his doctrine in archaeology from Oxford, committed his entire life to archaeology and went to the Holy Land with one goal, to undermine the his historical reliability of the Bible. That was the only reason he went. His number one target was the book of Acts. He was going to make Acts just a liar. Nothing in it was true. And he thought because it, he would do it because Acts was filled with so much history. And it would be an easy target. He said, this is going to be easy. I'm going to find so many things that are not real uh, about this. And over time, he went and he would, he, he, he would go in there and he'd have the Bible in one hand. And a shovel in the other hand, and he would go just digging and looking. And after 30 years of study and going through all this dirt, here's what he said. Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements as fact trustworthy. This author should be placed along with the greatest of historians. Luke's history is unsurpassed in respect to his trustworthiness. That's from an atheist. God made a believer out of him. I can give you so many other quotes, and I can give you so many other examples, and I can do it all, but I want to just tell you one more, and we'll, we'll move on to the second point. Dr. Nelson Gluck, who is considered the greatest modern authority on Israeli archaeology, uh, and this is what he said. No archaeologist's discovery is ever converted 
a biblical reference. No archaeologist's discovery has ever converted a biblical reference. Archaeology continues to confirm a clear outline or an exact detail of historical, historical statements in the Bible. Exact. It's not just some off to the left and maybe covering a big... It's exact. Jesus said this, Your word is truth. Your word is truth. So the second thing that we need to understand about the Bible is I believe the Bible because it is scientifically comparable or compatible. I'm not afraid to, to tell you that. I'm not really afraid of that because, you know, science has done the Bible so many great, really done so much to confirm the Bible every time you turn around. You see, some say the Bible is not a science book, but by logic itself it is God's word, and I believe that. But science has proven God's word so many different ways. You see, a lot of times we automatically jump to the conclusion that the Bible has scientific errors in it. And it cannot reconcile science and the Bible. Well, you better know two things if you say that and you believe that. You better know your Bible and you better know true science. Because science has done a, a wonder of making the Bible true. The Bible's not written to teach us science, per se. It's not, because when I think of science, I think I'm going to cut open a, and I know it's biology, but, I, you know, I, I think in my science class, I had frogs to cut open, and that, that doesn't have anything to do with the Bible, but science is, we think differently. But you see, many principles of modern science were recorded as facts of nature in the Bible long before science ever confirmed them. Do you ever know that? There's a tremendous overlap with science and the Bible almost from the very beginning. Both the Bible and science claim the universe had a beginning, correct? We know that those guys, some of those, they believe it was an explosion. But I'm going to tell you what, when I get sick and my body starts hurting, I know that all of this couldn't come from an explosion. All right? God created me. How about you? You see, and that's in the beginning. It begins with the words... And the Bible says, in the beginning. Now what is striking, even though the Bible claims this for thousands of years, scientists only began recently, they began to really entertain the possibility that there, there might have, well, there might have been a beginning. You know, they don't, want to, they don't want to believe that. They want to think it's always happened. But scientists are beginning to say, well, maybe so. You see, a lot of scientists thought that the universe was eternal and that Really, that dominated what science were thinking. Scientists were thinking. And, and, and then science came along, and then they began to change their way. You see, for thousands of years, the world, for the most part, believed the earth was flat. You remember that? The earth was flat. They're going to fall off the end. You remember those? And for, for 5th century B.C., when the ancient Greek came to call the world a spear or a round thing, then all of that was already said in the Bible. Did you know that? When they started saying the wor world was round, the Bible had already spoken to that. In Isaiah 40, verse 22, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. And its people are like grasshoppers. That's 3,000 years before scientists come up with the idea. See, for thousands of years, educated people thought wind blew in straight directions. We all know that's not true because <laughs> the hurricane just taught us that, right? <laughs> you know, for thousands of years, and then meteorologists all now, they know that wind travels within circuits. All right? They, in circuits. They call them what? Jet streams. All right? So guess what we find in the Word of God about that in Ecclesiastes 1.6? Shows you how the Bible is precise. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. Duh. People could learn a lot. This is why you need this book, the Bible, in our schools. Amen. See, I could give you many more examples of how the Bible has impacted everything from medicine to astrology to ge geology uh, everything, but the Bible properly understands, understood, and science that uh, pretty much we could do all of that, and science just pretty much just makes it accurate 
or tell. It just confirms it. You see, science shouldn't be an enemy. Scientists shouldn't be an enemy to the Bible. They should love it because it makes what they're teaching true. The third reason I believe the Bible because is it's prophetically correct or fulfilled. There's no other book anywhere on the planet that can match the staggering accuracy accuracy of foretelling future events like the Bible. Now, I know, don't get me in, and I'm not going into prophesying or prophecy or anything like that. But the Bible can tell, and we can see it. You see, in the Bible, 2,000 prophecies have come to pass about that. Don't hold me to the exact number, but that's the number that we think in a lot of the old, uh, a lot, uh, smart people, smarter than me, say. They'll say about 2,000 prophecies have come to pass. And you can't find anything like that in any other book in the world. 26 volumes of book claim to be divine scripture, just like the Bible, but not one. Not one of those 26 volumes have any specific predictive prophecies. And I'm telling you, that's in there in all these books. But I want you to just remember, and let's just take a couple of things out of the Bible. Let's take the central character of the Bible, Jesus. Jesus. There are 300 fulfilled prophecies about the life of Jesus Christ, and they were all written at least 400 years before he was born. Okay? To put this in perspective, what if a book had been written in 1900 that would predict that in the 20th century there would be two world wars, a Great Depression, an atomic bomb, and the assassination of a president and a civil rights leader? Would you, you would want to put your trust in that book, wouldn't you? If it was doing that. If it told you all of that, you would put your trust in that. Let me just give you one that is up to date right now out of the Bible. At one time, did you know in the Bible? Well, at one time, Egypt was one of the greatest nations in the entire world. Let me tell you what, the, just listen. One time, Egypt was the greatest nation in the entire world. It was at one time perhaps the greatest now, the king uh, there was uh, the king of many nations, and all of this was going on. Egypt was the richest country, and yet prophet Ezekiel prophesied this about Egypt. Listen, and this happened, and you'll see how it kind of plays into our life today. Ezekiel 30, verse 13. No longer will there be a prince in Egypt. Now, you say, well, preacher D, what's that mean? A few decades ago, before Egypt went through a war, kind of like going in through a democratic form of government, Egypt was always ruled by a prince up till a couple of decades ago. But guess what? During nearly the 2,500 years between this prophecy that Ezekiel did and Egypt's change to their present form of government, none of those princes were ever Egyptian. That would be like prophesying today that an American would never again be president of the United States and then having 2,500 years go by with no American president. How in the world did Ezekiel know that? How did he know that? He was speaking the word of God. You see, Jesus said, your word is truth. See, Ezekiel was prophesying. Fourthly, I believe the Bible because it's really theme it's got a theme, but that theme is unified. It's unified. Let me ask you a question. If you chose 10 different people from the same city, with the same culture, with the same education level, speaking the same language apart from each other, never talking to each other, never consulting with each other, think about one controversial uh, topic we got. Let's just say the meaning of life. What are the chances that they would absolutely form end-to-end, -end, totally in agreement? They would be totally in agreement. That would be zero. I could take 10 of y'all, give you that, and it would be totally zero. Now imagine this. Now imagine this, and I'm just telling you why the Bible is, the theme is unified and everything's together. Here's a book that is actually 66 books in one book. It was written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors living in three different continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa, writing in three different languages, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. They were written by all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds, some educated, some not so much. Some were written by shepherds, some by kings, some by soldiers, some princes, 
some by priests, some by fishermen, historians, professionals, and minimum wage workers. They, that's who wrote it. They wrote on many controversial topics, on every moral and ethical issue you could almost imagine, and they all wrote on one thing, and they all said basically the same thing. And when you read this book, you don't feel like you're reading 66 books, do you? No, you feel like you're reading one. See, for example, in the Bible, the Bible begins in the Garden of Eden, in the Garden of Paradise, and that garden is called a tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when you go to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, written 1,500 years later, you again end up in the paradise of God, where there is also another tree, the tree of healing for the nations. You see, in Genesis, a man is driven out of the garden because of his sin and forbidden to eat the fruit of the tree. In Revelations, he is invited to come and partake of the tree that he might live forever. Do you see that? See, in Genesis, there's a river which flows from the garden. In Revelation, there is a river flowing to the throne of God. The golden thread that runs from Genesis to Revelation is the redemption of a sinful human race by the grace of God through faith in a Redeemer named Jesus Christ. That's what the whole thread for the whole book is all about. The first Adam separated us from God, separated from God in the garden. The second Adam began the process of reuniting us with God on the cross. And you see, the unity of this Bible cannot be explained, in my opinion, in any other way except the Word of God. And Jesus said, your Word is truth. That's it. Now lastly... I believe the Bible because it is personally transforming. I gave you a lot of history, a lot of things scientifically why, and you already knew that, but it's important because I think this is even more important. I want you to listen very carefully. When I say I believe the Bible is true, I mean the Bible is factual. That is historically reliable, scientifically compatible, prophetically fulfilled, and it's unified through its theme all the way through. All of that can be true of a book and yet may not have a real lasting personal significance. What do you mean, preacher? What do you mean? When I tell you I believe the Bible is true, I believe it is significantly true because it is still the only book, the only book that you can read that can answer these three key questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? And where am I going? You know, we learned in the very first two chapters of the Bible where human beings were created in the image of God. From that point on, the Bible answers the second question. Why am I here? Why am I here? Today, so many people I hear them, I don't even know what I'm here for. I've gone to places and said, I don't even know what I'm here for. How many of you have ever walked in the room and said, what am I here for? I've done that, but you know, that's the question. What am I here for? To know that God who created you and me and to have a relationship with him and to know his purpose and carry out his plan for our life, which can only happen through knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Let me tell you what, you can't answer question two if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. See, the Bible concludes by telling us where are we going? There's so many people in our world are going down a dead-end road. And they know it. But they got to hit that wall. We all know people like that. The Bible concludes by telling us where we're going. We're either going to one or two places. Dwight shared this the other night at the singing. And it, just, it was just amazing. We're either going to heaven. People don't like for me to use this word in church. Or you're going to hell. I mean, we're either going to a place called heaven where we will spend eternity with God, a God that loves us, created us, and sent his son to die for us, or we will go to a place of complete, complete separation from God because we rejected that very son he sent to save us, and that's a place called hell. Let me tell you what, 
I've preached many a funeral and I've used this thing that if they were here today, they would tell you there is a place called heaven because I know the people I've preached uh, sermons for that had a relationship with Jesus, that's where they were at. And let me tell you, I've had a couple where I worried because I wasn't 100% sure they made it to heaven and it scared me because heaven and hell is real. You see, you can either believe everything I've just said or you can take it with a grain of salt. But here is where everybody has to make a decision. There's a lot of religious books out there. There's a lot of help books. There's all sorts of things that say things about God. They th say things about heaven. You want to make a big, I tell you what, right now, if you want to get rich, write a book about prophecy. They'll buy it even if it don't make sense. But you see, there's so many books out there, but I'm going to tell you what. There's only one, the Bible, which has Jesus Christ as the hero. So you have two options this morning to think about what I've said. All those other people who have written all these books and believe something else, they're all wrong. Or you can say, there's one book that's right, the Bible. You see, you can say that everything about the Bible is all false. Or you can say, no, it is true. And I know for me and a billion of other people who have through the years bought that, the book or have decided to take God's word at his word have ever been changed. Let me tell you something. Let me close with a story from Abraham Lincoln. I don't know, you might have heard it, maybe not. Abraham Lincoln kept a copy of the Bible in his library. One day, a Treasury Department official happened to walk in and saw him reading his Bible and asked him what he thought about the Bible. Here's what Abraham Lincoln said. If we had a witness on the stand whose general story we knew was true, we would believe him when he asserted facts of which he ha we had no other evidence. I saw, uh, decided a long time ago that it was less difficult to believe that the Bible was what it claimed to be than it was to disbelieve it. I don't believe this Bible right here is the Word of God just because people say it. I believe this Bible is the Word of God because of the overwhelming evidence which is on the inside of it. I hope you've read it. I hope you don't just pick it up and read a verse. Let me tell you what, God's Word is truth. How many of you know the... I wish I had the children out here would get them. Jesus loves me. There you go. There you go. For the Bible. See, I don't think there is a God in heaven who just loves me. I know he loves me. Why do I know he loves me? He sent his only son to be beaten like he's, nobody ever has been beaten since. He died on a cross, but he rose. And that's not just a myth. There's evidence to know that. Now, this book is truth, and when you know the truth, let me tell you what, it will set you free. See, there's a lot of people with a lot of bondages today walking around. We all know them. They have a lot of problems. You might be worrying and carrying a, a load of rocks that this world has put in your wagon. But you know what? God is saying, give it to me. And if you truly believe it, and I tell you what, this is the thing. We heard Chip talking, and he preached, and we heard the Holy Spirit speaking. But let me tell you what, if you know this Bible is the truth, then act like it. Live it. See, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me.
And I'm going to close with this challenge. Let me tell you what. There's so many people. And there's people sitting in this room this morning that think they're going to heaven and they're going to see Jesus one day because you came to church today. Let me tell you what. Unless you know Jesus Christ and his word is truth and you've accepted and surrendered to it, you're going to bust hell wide open. Won't you stand? As Connie and Renee come and as Renee plays, everybody just stand with your eyes closed and your head bowed. My first question is this. Do you truly believe this Bible, this book we call the Holy Bible, is God's holy word and you live your life based upon it? Do you truly believe what John 3 16, for God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son to die a death, to pay a debt that we never could pay so we could go and be with him in heaven. Guys, we're getting away from the word of God and listening to the world and a lot of these self-help books. God just wants us to come back to the truth. And as Jesus said, his word is the truth. Get back to the basics. What do you need to turn over to God this morning? Maybe you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ. And if you were to die today, you're not sure you'd go to heaven. Well, come down let me pray with you. We'll make sure and we'll get that thing settled. Maybe you're here today and you're carrying some loads that you've just been looking for answers. Well, let me tell you what, come here and we'll pray and we'll ask God for the answers from his book. But whatever it is, as Renee plays, don't wait, don't look around, nobody's looking. You come and do business with Jesus. Father, we commit this time to you in Jesus' name. Renee's playing the invitation. Do you know him today? Don't turn him away. Oh, Jesus. And all God's people said, won't you be back tonight? We'll look into God's Word after our business meeting, and uh, we'll see what God has to say for us. Go and just let everybody know that. Won't you just share the good news that comes from the Bible with someone this week? What a joy that would be. You know, His Word tells us to do that. Let's just do it. Eric, would you close us in prayer, please?